I'm Chauncey Mashburn, co-author of the novel Wicked Ways. It's a fictional story of how a small town deals with the rising meth epidemic. In addition to the novel, we decided to take a closer look of cities and small towns all across the U.S. This is Meth's Wicked Ways. I got involved with drug addiction at a really young age. Um, for me, it started off honestly um, with drinking, and my mom was is an, is an active addiction. Um, so when I was younger, all of my friends like lived with us, and they were all using and. One of them introduced me to it when I was 14, um, because it was okay in my house for everybody to do it. Um, so I started using meth when I was 14. I started doing other things when I was probably 12 or 13, but my meth addiction started when I turned 14. I started using uh, meth and marijuana at the ages of 13 and was... Uh was already put into a residential treatment center at 14 years old. Um, had a psychotic episode from meth and a Ritalin overdose. Hi, I'm Linda Versharon. I'm the executive director of the Family Alliance of Paldy. Uh, we started back in 2005, and we were the fan the Meth Alliance of Paldy Incorporated. Um, I have a background um, working with child abuse and neglect. And at the time, I was working in a program called Paulding Family Matters. And most of my clients were from child abuse and neglect situations. And about 97% of them were due to substance abuse of some form. And back in those days, in the early 2000s, um, most of the substance abuse was methamphetamines. Didn't really understand or know about it much, hadn't been educated in, in that until I went to a training and found out what meth was and what it was doing to our families. And uh, because of the program that I was working with, I was able to work with law enforcement and the judicial system and pretty much everybody in the county that had anything to do as a professional with families and, and children. And um, so on um, May 2nd of 2005, we started the Meth Alliance of Paulding. And it was specifically to battle and educate the epidemic that was going on. Um, we were just all of our families that were having crisis situations. It was all due to methamphetamines. So um, we just started out as a very grassroots, just again to battle it uh, and to hopefully have prevention. And um, then we got our 501c3 and a formal board and, and moved forward from there. But we really tried at that time to focus on prevention. Um, we weren't quite as familiar with the treatment. Nobody was really familiar with treatment. There just wasn't a lot of treatment out there. Because um, it came in not just Paulding County, not just to Georgia, but it came in to our, you know, to our country just you know, like crazy. Now, I will tell you that Atlanta and our area was impacted and remained the um, the the hot spot, if you will, for meth, um, and it still very much is. Uh, in 1996, when we had the Olympics, that's when we started to see methamphetamines really come into Atlanta. And because we are such an awesome transportation hub in good ways, unfortunately, it it became um, a transportation hub for methamphetamines yeah. as well. Um, at first, it was great. Um, honestly, um, it was like my best friend. It gave me everything that I felt that I lacked. And I started, I didn't finish high school. Um, I guess it started there. Um, I got in a lot of trouble in middle school. Um, I started getting arrested for little things. And I cut ties with all of my family. Um, everybody that cared about me that wanted me to stop, I... I felt like they hated me. Um, I was homeless. I had nowhere to live. I couldn't keep a job. I lost my car. In 2015, at July of 2015, I lost custody of my daughter. And at that point, I had nobody left to help me and nowhere to go. Um, so at a, at a really young age, meth and uh, meth and Ritalin, Adderall, all gave me that um, 
that accepted feeling that I, that I lacked all of my life that, that I looked for in school um, with my family with, in, in other areas um, so using it at a young age was was very fun for me it, it, it filled a void in my life that I didn't have um, as I got older I started struggling with the true sides of addiction and um, I would have brief periods of that euphoric feeling and then I would go back to the immediate uh, deep hole of depression um, in and out of rehabs and recovery centers from uh, 14 years old to, uh, to today at 31. Now is the meth epidemic uh, a growing problem or is it something that has become to you know start to become under control by any any, any way shape or form? Well I think that um, in you know and it does vary you know, you have where you see what's going on in, say, you know, urban Atlanta. Um, they have, they, you know, they're really, really battling heroin right now. Um, but in Paulding County and in, in still so many communities, so many counties in, you know, in Georgia, we have 159 counties. Um, you're you're going to see different drugs in each one. Um, but meth is still alive and well out there. You know, I mean, forms of methamphetamine have been around. I mean, it was Hitler's drug of choice. Hitler used a form of amphetamines, um, and they thought that he was, he was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. We know, you know, how he was and what he did. Um, so there have been forms of meth, you know, back since then. Um, our kamikaze pilots used it to give them the energy you know, and within the speed, basically, that they needed to do what they needed to do. In the 60s, we saw our white bi biker gangs that used it. Um, there was a different ingredient back in those times. It was it was called Benzedrine. And Benzedrine was a pharmaceutical FDA-approved um, drug that helped with, um, it was used as an appetite suppressant and to help with depression. Well, people started misusing it and it was pulled from the market so we kind of saw that form back in those days it was known as crank and the reason why it was called crank is because the white biker gangs that's how they would get it past law enforcement and they would put it in their crankshaft or their motorcycles mm -hmm. okay so then when we talked about in 1996 when we really saw it come into Atlanta that's now the pseudoephedrine um, you know that everybody uses for their allergies mm -hmm. which is an awesome ingredient um, so you really saw it, you know, coming in, in, in the mid nineties and into, into the two thousands, you know, just really, really strong and heavy. Um, no matter what drug, you know, we had heroin back in the sixties, which there wasn't, you know, there was people use that like crazy. All of our, our, you know, rock star bands and all of those, they even used heroin. And then you saw it go down a little bit. Now it's just really, really taken an uptake. So just like meth, just like any drugs, you're going to have your highs and your lows. Yeah. You know, you're going to have, hey, this is the drug of choice right now. Um, but we just have never seen it. I don't think there's ever a way to totally eradicate it. Um, we have made good, solid progress because when it first came in, in the epidemic proportions, um, nobody knew really what was going on. It was an old drug, but it was a new formula. And so even our treatment providers, they weren't quite sure what to do with it. We didn't have the understanding of it. How it was affecting our, our children because of the use of the, you know, of their parents using it. And we just had no idea it would, it would just be so insurmountable. And now because we're educated, now our treatment providers are educated, we have more treatment facilities, we have more beds, we understand it more. It's still out there, but I think we are able to, to handle it a little bit better and yeah. to do treatment better and to educate. And hopefully with now with the, the Family Alliance educating for 11 years, um, prevention is so hard to get good data on because you have no way of knowing what somebody may have done. But, you know, our numbers from, um, you know, f from car thefts and, you know, crime, those have, have gone down a little bit. And we like to hope to think it's because of the education yeah. that we've had out there. In my opinion, it's been, it's just terrible. Um, I see people like myself and other people that I know in, in and out of recovery also that, um, that are generally good people, you know, that would do anything to help someone that, that cares about the community, that cares about themselves and their families. And then, um, 
six months to a year later, you see them, they've lost everything. They don't have their kids. They don't have any friends, any family, um, no self-respect, and all because of a drug that they can't stop using. Um, no, no choice in the matter, and that's where it got for me and with other people that, I, that I've known that you can't stop, you know. If someone has a friend or a family member that's addicted to meth, um, what steps should they take to get them into treatment? Well, that's, you know, that's always a little bit tricky. I get phone calls sometimes daily, um, definitely, you know, several times a week from husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and grandparents and, you know, neighbors, anybody who knows somebody who's involved in meth, they always want to help. And you always should. Um, you always want to, to reach out and find out what is out there for somebody that you love and care about. Um, meth treatment, as I said before in the last question, was very hard. We were looking at some staggering data back in those days. Um, people would ask me, you know, what's, what's the recovery rate? How easy is it for somebody to recover? Um, and, you know, anybody who is an addict of any kind, they're always in recovery every day for the rest of their life. You are always recovering. Um, you know, AA has taught that, that to us for years, for generations. Um, but back in the days, we were looking at 5 to 7% recovery for meth addicts, which is just, you know, mind-boggling. Yeah. But that, I really believe those numbers were skewed a little bit because there wasn't enough treatment out there. There weren't enough beds to keep up with the people who needed treatment. So we've seen that, go, you know, go up. But for anybody who, who you know, I think that if you, if you have a loved one or a family member that needs treatment, the best thing that you can do is to go out and to educate yourself. Get on the website. Google. Find out what's available out there for them. Find out. I mean, I have, you know, four or five pages of treatment facilities that will work with folks who are addicted to meth. Um, Google it. Like I said, find out where they are. Do your research on them. Do your research on any facility that you are wanting to send somebody to or that they want to go to. Make sure there's a lot of fly-by-night, non-credentialed treatment facilities out there. So please do your homework. Um, go on, make sure, check with the Better Business Bureau, check with, you know, make sure they're accredited, go on the reviews, you know, just really spend some time, get everything lined up, have, ev have all of your ducks in a row, even before you approach that, that person, that loved one. Um, because ultimately, if they're not a child, you know, if they're, if they're not a, a juvenile, ultimately, it's up to them. Yeah. They have got to want it. You can't want it for them. You have, they have got to be the one that wants it. They have to be to the point where they are saying, please tell me what I need to do. Exactly. Please tell me what I need to do to get help. And then you'll, then you'll have everything you know, that you need. But there's plenty of websites. Our website's out there. You know, you'll give my information. Anybody's you know, welcome to call me to give any information. Um, but the most important thing is they have to want it. And that's very hard for a family member to just want to sit there and see them going through all of this because they want to just pick them up and take them there. But until they want it, I don't want to say don't waste your money, but you know, they have to be the one that's reaching out. Yeah. Well, it, it started when I, a couple months after I lost custody of her, um, I was still running around and I got to a point where I was, I feel like I truly surrendered. I had totally given up. I didn't know what else to do. I was miserable. Um, and when I, I went into a treatment program and I started to learn about myself, um, I've totally rebuilt my life. I have things now that I thought were way out of my reach. Um, I am exactly the person that I thought that I could never be. I have my family back. I'm starting, I just started class. I'm working towards being a certified addiction counselor. And the way that I feel just about myself and the gifts that my recovery has given me, I don't ever want to go back to where I was. It's two, two total opposites of the pole. For, for me, the recovery process has been beautiful. Um, what in, and also, what inspired it? Uh, uh, what, what inspired it was, um, was jail for me. Um, I, I was arrested, I think, 22 times last year. I'm sorry, a year before last. I've been clean for 15 and a half months now. So. Um, the last time I went to jail, I was empty uh, inside, you know, um, 
all the previous trips to jail, I still had plenty of drugs, a little bit of money, so so there was really no need to stop. But this last time when I went in, um, I had this hopeless sinking feeling that, that my life was going to end, you know, um, and not end in jail. It was going to end. I was going to overdose and die. Um, so I started reaching out for help to get into treatment at that point, and that was in uh, February of 2016. Um, from that point forward, my recovery has been beautiful. Um, I was released from jail in late May. I went in directly into a treatment facility, and, I, and I'm still there today. Um, I'm in a three-quarter house now. Uh, through, through that, I've gained uh, my family, my friends back, my, my self-esteem. I've, um, I've got a great job. I've got a nice car, a good place to live. Uh, I've got my, my son's back in my life full time now, so um, recovery's given me everything I've wanted in just a very short period of time, you know, and uh, I don't see those gifts stopping. So. What kinds of programs does the uh, Family Alliance of Paulton County offer? Well, so we were just talking about, um, you'll have my information. Um, we have two websites. Uh, we kept our Meth Alliance of Paulding website uh, separate from our Family Alliance one because it's really two different audiences. You're welcome to go to the website. You're certainly welcome to provide my email address, um, any contact information that they can, they can call. Family Alliance is not a treatment provider, but what we have done is we have gathered treatment providers all over really the southeast and then we even have um, some other beyond that that um, that we can you know that we can link them with that we can you know suggest that they that they use um, but again we don't we don't offer treatment now any any family member is willing welcome to call me and I have you know a background of information that I can at least get them going on the right track yeah. So, but we, there's some awesome, you know, treatment providers around locally. Um, I feel like first and foremost, it needs to be talked about more. Um, and definitely not to just to just say no to drugs. Um, there needs to be more communication and more awareness of it. Um, and I, I feel like everybody's quick to just kind of throw everybody in jail. And it needs to be moved more towards a rehabilitation kind of thing. Um, and it is, from my experience, a family disease. So I think it needs to be more work done with the families and the mothers to keep it from happening with the kids. And we need more resources out here that are easily available for people that do want the help. Because there's not a whole lot around here. Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know how to speak on any of the drug addiction other than the meth stuff. And um, and just in my personal experience, what I've seen is that uh, police intervention's always been necessary for me to quit. Um, you know, I, I know other people promote awareness and other things, and I agree that probably works. But, but for an addict like myself, um, I didn't stop until I was forced to stop. So it was, uh, I guess, a divine in intervention through the judicial system is what saved me. So um, that would be all I would have on that. What do you need from the community to actually help fight this meth epidemic? I mean, there's got to be something that the community could do to stand up and, you know, get involved and help everyone out with this, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Um, this, this, and this does stretch out into the community, um, you know, because people think that, oh, well, that doesn't, that doesn't have anything to do with my family. I have found out from doing this for as many years in the county, again, you know, going on, well, more than 11 years, that at this point, somebody knows somebody mm -hmm. who has been impacted by this. If it's not their family directly, it's somebody in their church or their neighborhood, you know, you know somebody. Yeah. So it does impact everybody. And it does impact everybody. It impacts every taxpayer because, you know, Whenever there are crimes that are committed, shoplifting that goes on, break-ins, you know, it, it, it comes back and it affects you somehow, even if in your pocketbook by, by, you know, by what goes on in our community. So, it, yes, it does. You can get involved. Um, educate. Like I said, go on. If you do not contact me, find out where I'm speaking next. Um, find out if I'm speaking in your child's school. Um, request that I speak at your child's school or at your, at your church, at your civic organization. We have committed for these years that I will go and do training just about anywhere. I've traveled all over the country. Um, and we locally, we never charge in our community 
or our surrounding communities for me to come and do some education. Education, education, like I said, prevention Mm -hmm. go hand in hand. So, um, but if you, if you can't get to me or get to a training by somebody, then go on and just Google, you know, you pull up meth, and you'll see there's just all this wonderful, wonderful information out there, or any drugs. Yeah. Um, if, you have a, if you have a child, if you have a student, please don't stick your head in the sand and think, I've got a great kid, because there's just so much out there. So go on, educate. If you got your a student going into college, just you know, make sure that you give them the information. So that's the one thing that I would really suggest. Parents, grandparents, anybody, have an open dialogue. Um, if it's an adult, still have an open dialogue. So that's, that's something that can be done, um, that I really encourage everybody to do also, and, and, and to have somebody come in and educate even your workforce. The other thing is we are a 501 C3 nonprofit. Um, we have a couple of grants that support the other two programs that I mentioned. Um, we do not have a, any grant funding that funds what we do here in our drug education. And I just said, we don't, we don't charge. Um, so you can make a donation to us um, or just you know find a place to get yourself involved in. If you're sitting there, you like to volunteer somewhere, we can always use volunteers. We try and get out in the community at the community events. We always, there's only one of me and, and so many staff members. So, or get involved if, if it's not in Paulding, just get involved where you can yeah. on trying to make a difference um, in, you know, in prevention. You heard it. Get involved, people. Well, thank you so much for everything. It was very Absolutely. informative. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you doing this.